Welcome to the DJ The Money Coach Expert Interview Series, the leadership edition of the Expert Interview Series. I'm Nick, and as always, I'm joined by the founder of the Seven Spheres of Money, DJ The Money Coach. Hey, DJ, how's everything? Hey, man, this is a moment I've been waiting for for 14 years. I'm so excited. This is... Uh, Man, this, this this person here taught me everything about, you know, putting teams together, taught me about uh, business, how to work with corporate America. I mean, I uh, read his book back in 2005 called Success Runs in Our Race and the Power of neck, Networking versus Neck Working, which, which, which George would always talk about when we first had the chance to meet. So I'm honestly, man, I'm humbled to... Uh, had the chance to uh, interview George because George literally gave me the wings to actually become a public speaker. And um, man, I can't say enough about George, but uh, I'm going to try. So here's how we go. So if you don't know me, I'm DJ the money coach. And I, at one point in time, my life came out of college. I had over $40,000 worth of consumable debt in addition to my student loans. And I had a 525 credit score. I was turned down for my first mortgage. And I was turned down for my first business loan. But I read a book called The Road to Wealth. And I actually read one chapter on credit. And within 12 months, my credit score rose from 525 to over 700. Within 24 months, my credit score rose over 800. Right now, today, my credit score is 806. And in 2002, I became consumer debt free. I owned everything with my name on it, Nick. And, and six years later, upon meeting George, in 2006, he showed me the platform that propelled me to become financially independent. I became a heavy six-figure income earner and in passive income through businesses, real estate, and stocks, where I was actually privileged to have a program on George's platform called Three Steps to Success, where George actually embraced me and my childhood friends and let us go on his platform and teach our people about financial independence at that time and I had a seven-figure net worth in 2008 and have not looked back since. And what I learned from that from George was, you know what? You have to bring people up with you or we can't multiply. So George also wrote a book called Click. And in Click, he has this picture of a web that talks the power of networking. And it used to be called, you know, Six Degrees of, 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 of what is it? Six Degrees of Separation. Uh, separation degrees but it really... Degrees three degrees of separation. That's how powerful George's message was to us. So with that, guys, George has been doing this for 50 years. I mean, his accolades is beyond ridiculous. And since I know him personally, I'm still going to, you know, give an encapsulation of some of the accomplishments it has. He's number one in Forbes magazine was considered the top five conference to come to, which is the Fraser Net Power Networking Conference. And that conference is amazing in of itself. I had the pleasure of going to it several times. And, and you know what the most powerful thing for me was, George, is that I went there and I was just blown away that I would see 10,000 black professionals that look just like me. And I was at that time thinking it was an exception to the rule, but I found out it was the rule. And I know this introduction to George is so long, but guess what? I would not be doing George in service if I didn't give him this long introduction. I mean, George actually came down to Houston on my behalf to help kickstart my speaking career at the Houston Federal Reserve Bank. And he was the draw. I was just the icing on the cake. George was the draw. And, and, and the standing room only black tire affair rocked it out. George then allowed us to go on conference tour with him. It was like, I'll equate it to this. It was like meeting Michael Jackson or meeting Michael Jordan and playing side by side with them. That's how George impacted my life. So without further ado, obviously it's Dr. George Frazier, PhD, four doctors that are you know honorary in, in, in addition to over a million people George has impacted in my lifetime since I've known him. And he's also reached out to me and collaborated with me as well, guys. In 2016, George brought me on board with his insurance uh, company that he partnered with because 
unbeknownst to me, he considered me to be the expert in that field, and I was just humbled by it. So I'm not going to take any more of this time, but here's him. Humble, integrity, the man, my mentor, who helped give me what I am doing now, Dr. George Frazier. How you doing this evening, George? I am doing wonderful, Dale. Um, listen, you're embarrassing me, right? Right. <laughs> Uh, I, I know I'm an uh, an elder, um, but but I don't know if I deserve all those accolades. But thank you very 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 much. Um, listen, you yourself, and, and as I told you right before we got on air, you a you have an age, you're still smart as a whip, you are the bomb dot com, you're one of the most I think intelligent, the most aggressive, uh, but and but 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 a brother that has character and integrity, right? When I look at your family and I look at what you've done as a, as a black man, as a model for your children, that your, your sons will have a model that they will use when they measure themselves as a young man. And your daughter has a model of a black man that they will measure whomever they choose as their man in their life it will model their father so it, it's just an honor to be with you i haven't seen you in a long long time but again you look absolutely great and again you you sound smart uh, you sound smarter actually because you're, you're you're older and wiser but uh, i appreciate it man i really do appreciate it nick thank you for uh, helping facilitate this making this come together and so we're going to have a rich conversation, and um, I don't want to take up any more time. I just want to get into whatever you want to get into, whatever you want to do. Absolutely, absolutely. I got a, I got a tech flying over Bob, George. I'm right there. I'm the street, I'm right down the street from the Eglin Air Force Base. So I got oh. the in Fort Walton, which is about 30 miles from here. So these beautiful F-15 fighter jets fly over like every every 30, 40 minutes. So okay, okay. That pom-pom lifestyle, which is plenty of money, peace of mind. So yeah, I want to jump right in. And George, I want to ask you a couple of questions initially about why you were called or why you thought you were called to do what you do and connect our people. And I remember one thing you always mm -hmm. told me. You said, you know what? When everything's equal, bet on black. But if everything's not equal, get the next highly qualified person to do the job. So let's gotcha. start right there, George, and, and give us, because I always have lived by that motto when you taught me. That, that, that's right. And and to, to bring a little, little further clarity to it, uh, I, I have always said to our people, do not buy from a black person just because they're black. That does not help you or them. And I learned this from Jewish people. Jews do not buy from Jews just because they're Jewish. When all things are equal and you can get the same quality, value, and service for your hard-earned money, and that's what you deserve for your hard-earned money, Dale, when all things are equal, the tiebreaker is I'm black, you're black. You get the business. That's the tiebreaker. Black is not the determining factor. You ain't stupid. You can say buy black to black people all you want, and they will yes your ass to death. But they're not <laughs> stupid, right? They're going to they're looking for the best bang for their buck, right? Now, white folks mess up, black folk mess up. The problem we have is that if the black person messes up, we don't give them a second chance. We give white people endless chances, right? So if, in fact, you make the decision to use a black person and for one reason or another, it isn't exactly what you expected, you constructively critique them and you give them a second chance, right? You do it for white people every day of the week. Right. So that thank you for starting with that, because that's a very, very deep and very, very important idea. Um, I want to say something about a piece of the first question that you started with and then you morphed into that. That very important. Yes, um, why was or have I have been chosen to lead? Um, let me say it a couple of different ways. 
Black people want progress without execution. That's why in 21 years since Rodney King, Trayvon Martin, George Floyd, you name the whole myriad of brothers that have been killed at the hands of police. We have marketed, we've saber rattled, we've picketed, we've rioted, but we did not organize and execute. And therefore, if you look at the kill rate of police forces around the country over just the last 10 years, nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. So this is 21 years of this bullshit and still nothing has changed. So what am I saying? I'm saying that we are not suffering because we cannot resolve our problems. We are suffering because we cannot see our problems succinctly and clearly. And I think that we have been hurt more by what we don't know than by what we can't do. All right. There's a beautiful passage in the Bible that most people have only read half of the passage. They're very familiar with it. It's Hosea 4, verses 6, and it says, My people perish because of the lack of knowledge, right? Now, the rest of the sentence is, Because thou has rejected knowledge, I also reject thee. This is God talking to you. You don't want to learn, you're rejecting reading, you're rejecting knowledge, then I reject you. Right? Why have I been chosen? Because I am one that executes. I am one that reads, that learns, that is intellectually curious. Because if you're not intellectually curious, if you're not curious about the world around you and all things around you, because your goal in life is to be an inch wide and a mile deep in your subject matter expertise, and then to be a mile wide and an inch deep in matters of the world so that you can talk about something more than the weather, soap operas, uh, real wide housewives of Atlanta and sports. Right. So you have to have a 360 degree sort of personality, emotional intelligence. Right. So this is what we have to expect from our people. We have to expect them to be intellectually curious, always seeking new knowledge, committed to personal growth, uh, uh, personal growth and development, lifelong learning, constant, never ending improvement. That's what we have to be committed to. Why, Dr. Fraser? Because why? Because of what my mama taught me many, many years ago. She said, Georgie boy, you're going to have to be twice as good to get half as much. Because if you're black and mediocre in America, you better leave because you're going to be marginalized and you're ultimately going to be destroyed. We cannot be mediocre, Dale. You know that. We have to be excellent. Only white people can be mediocre. Look at the president of the United States as compared to the black president who was elected, Barack Hussein Obama, president of the Harvard Law Review, right? Only a white man could be elected. Visible. We're either excellent, Nick, or we're invisible. So we have to be excellent. So I focus on excellence. That is really what uh, the Power Networking Conference is about. It is developing excellence and leadership through strategic alliances, joint ventures, partnerships. We focus only on two things, money and business. Because that's all the hell there is to talk about. As far Say as that I again, can, George. Right, <laughs> money and business, business startups, business growth, business development, and money. Economics must become the new black power. That's the thing we must focus on in the 21st century. That's all we talk about for four days and 96 hours. You know that. You were there, right? Oh, yeah. Only at this moment in time, that's what matters. Economic power. First, wow. economic power. And then you take your money and then you move into the political realm, as Dr. Claude Anderson has said for mm -hmm. many years, and then you buy rent and lease politicians. There right? you go. 
<laughs> laws in your favor. What do you think they do? What do you think corporations do? <laughs> they invest money into through lobbying into politicians to get laws changed in their favor so they can do business the way they want to do business. That's what we have to learn how to do. But you have to have the economic base from which to do that. It was um, Dr. Amos Dr. Wilson. You gotta, and you got to oh, Google, yeah. brothers and sisters, you got to oh, Google. I know, I know, I know. I'm reading, watching all the time. 1994, right? Um, uh, 1995. But Amos Wilson said, uh, before he died, he said, our refusal as black people to confront the issue of money and wealth is going to end up with our very lives being threatened as people on this earth. He is exactly right. So I was chosen because I understood that, that I did the work. And I believe that everything that we want, that you want, is on the other side of hard. Uh, I spoke at Morehouse before COVID. And a brother stood up and asked me, Dr. Fraser, why is it that so many black people have not succeeded at the levels that they have the potential to succeed? I said, it's a very simple answer. Most of us simply will not and do not want to do the work. We don't want to do the work. The God is constantly talking to us, Nick, and telling us exactly what to do, except most people choose not to listen because he's requiring us to grow and to change. And that's hard, right? It's easier sitting on uh, uh, the couch, drinking a beer, watching television. People don't want to do the work. Dale, you've always wanted to do the work. Nick, I, I guess you're hanging out with Dale, and Dale's hanging out with you, so you must be equally yoked and two people two brothers of like mind, or you just simply wouldn't tolerate each other, right? <laughs> so, but that, but that, that's, how it, that, that, that's how it has to be, right? Is you have to select the people around you. You know, you've heard me say this a million times, introduce me to your five closest friends and that will tell me who you are. As they know and as they go, so go you, right? You are the reflection of the, the five, your five closest friends. And you've heard me say a million times, Dale, um, if you're hanging out with five broke people in about a year, you're going to be the sixth broke person, right? <laughs> sixth broke person. So what am I saying? What I'm saying, I'm saying is don't spend major time with minor people. People going nowhere want you to go nowhere with them. People doing nothing want you to do nothing with them. If you want to change your life, change your relationships. If you are not where you want to be in life, it's because you don't have the right people in your life. These are the things that I know have internalized, expressed, evangelized, has spoken about for 34 years, 19 years in the Power Networking Conference, where Forbes selected us as one of the top five conferences in America not to be missed, not one of the top five black conferences, one of the top Conference. five of all the conferences Period. in the country not to be missed. So I know it's a long answer to your question, but you are chosen by God to do selected work when you demonstrate to God that you will move beyond pontificating ad nauseum about our issues and act on the issues and the challenges in which you understand and have the capacity to execute and deliver our people from evil. That's the bottom line. And you have to demonstrate that to God. There's another little riff I wanted to give you, but I know that's a long ass answer. <laughs> but, but I got to tell you this because because you got me excited. See, every time I'm around Dale, uh, Nick, this is what Dale does to me. Dale, Dale knows. I say I know what button to push on Doctor. <laughs> <laughs> right? Remember how you used to have a wind up machine and then you push the button? In? But Dale's like that. He he knows how to push my button. So so let me just give you a. a, a a deep spiritual lesson. My favorite quote outside of the Bible, Dale, is a quote by Marcus Aurelius, one of the okay. five great Caesars, one of the five great Caesars. He was leader of the free world, but he was also the one of the founders of the Stoic philosophy. I'm a Stoic. And Marcus Aurelius said, now this is deep, this is a mile deep, the impediment to action advances the action. What stands in your way becomes the way. Mm. I repeat that. The impediment to action advances the action. What stands in your way becomes the way. Let me say it a different way. 
The obstacle is the way. Right. Where there is no obstacle, there is no way. There is no way. So what is the first thing God does when he gives you an assignment, Dale, that he feels that he has prepared you for, you have done the work for, he gives you that assignment. And then the next thing God does is he puts an obstacle in your way. Why? And your job is to, over, to find a way to, to go around, over, and under the obstacles and to learn the lessons, to experience the failures, because there's far more to learn from failure than there is success. And when you find a way over, around, through, and under the obstacles, because you have successfully learned the lessons needed to do that, you then get an attaboy or you get an girl, and then God gives you a new assignment at a slightly higher level. And then what's the next thing God does? He puts an obstacle exactly. in your way. And your job way over, round, through, and under. And you see, when you look back over your life, that is the story of your life. That you have successfully overcome the obstacles, whatever they may be. Now, if you don't overcome the obstacle that God has put in your way, in my case, three years in orphanages and 15 years in foster care. Well, that's, a, that's an obstacle for your ass right there, right? All right? Mopping floors on the midnight shift and the, my, my first real job at LaGuardia Airport for three years. That's an obstacle, right? So when you find a way around the obstacle, you're promoted in a sense. If you don't, that's where you remain in life until you find a way around the obstacle put in front of you. And that is what I've internalized all of my life. And that's why I have acted on things and I've demonstrated to God with obstacles in front of me and demonstrated to a, a power higher than me that I was worthy, right, of more responsibility, that I was a critical thinker because I was intellectually curious. And then you, can, you cannot be a critical thinker thinker without having a knowledge base. I read a hundred books a year. I'm not bringing, I'm just saying, this is my office that I'm in. There's a thousand books behind me in my office, 25,000 books in my home. My wife is going to divorce me because she thinks I'm moving her <laughs> via books. <laughs> right? So I'm, I, I want to know, I want to learn. And, um, and I invest in myself. And at 75, I was five up at the top of my game, right? But last right. year, I spent $15,000 on personal growth and development, lifelong learning and constant never-ending improvement, going to conferences, workshops, seminars, buying books. And I'm already at the top of the mountain and 75. And I'm mm. still investing in the most important thing you can invest in. And that's you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And George, with, 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 that, with that said, I want to ask you a question to unpack a little bit of that. Right now, we've been talking about, you know, uh, American descendants of slavery, ADOS, and we've been talking about reparations. So what is corporate America responsibility financially to those people who their futures were built on their backs? I mean, mm -hmm. I personally think that we need to have, you know, economic, you know, justice where Corporate America, instead of doing these hashtag blackout Tuesday, they need to find vendors that they can do business with black businesses, notwithstanding hiring qualified black professionals. But I think from what I learned from you over the past 14 years, the biggest way to impact is to do business with black qualified businessmen. So what do you say to that? And how can we make that change right now as America is going through this unrest, George? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. By the end of the 21st century, Dale, black people must become the number one employer of black people. Every immigrant group that has ever come to this country has understood that but us. 97% of us have jobs. Now, there's lots of reasons and a psychological holocaust that we went through, second to none in the history of humankind. But at the end of the day, we now realize that we must create work and jobs for our people because that is the only way to raise up the poor. Jews are the number one employer of Jews. Asians are the number one employer of Asians. East Indians are the number one employer of East Indians. Arabs are the number one employer of Arabs. And we go on and on and on. In fact, if you go into an, uh, uh, an Asian restaurant in the hood, 
And there are plenty of them. And there are four brothers working in there waiting on you. Leave. That's not a real Asian restaurant. <laughs> Asians don't employ black people. They employ Asian people. And you can't hit on them for that because that's what we should do. Asians have solved their own unemployment problem just employing their own people exclusively. Mm. Now, how do we do that? We start and we build and we develop our businesses so that we can employ our people. So we have to start, build, and develop our business. Then black people need to support those businesses so those businesses can begin hiring their own people. So let me give you some statistics. There are 2.6 million black-owned businesses in America, according to the last five-year reporting period from the, the Census Bureau. That's the upside. Growth is 40% over the last five years. We're moving in the right direction. COVID's going to tamp it down a little bit, but we're moving in the right direction. The other interesting side uh, bar on that statistic is that the overwhelming majority of the growth of new businesses in black America, 60% of them is by black women. Right. So our women are out starting and developing businesses than our men, just like our women are now. There are now more black women in, 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 in uh, law school medical school, dental school, pharmacy school, than black men. That's a whole nother subject. I don't want to get off on that subject. All right. So women are developing businesses at a much faster rate than we are. Of the 2.6 million business, 111,000 of those businesses employ somebody. The average annual revenue of those 111,000 businesses that employ people is about $1.2 million a year. That growth is up about 11% over the last five year reporting period. So that means that 2.59 million of the 2.6 million businesses are sole proprietorship. Mm. The average annual revenue of those sole proprietorships is $18,000, $18,700 a year, which is below the poverty line. And that's down over the last five year reporting period, Dale, by 7%. So what does that mean? You either grow or you die. You grow or you die. Everything God has created is either growing or dying. There's no standing still. Growing means either you get larger and you employ our people. How do you get larger and employ your people? At least your own people should be supporting you, should be investing in you, should be allowing you to make mistakes, right? That's how you do it. And very important thought, very important idea. You got to understand the statistics behind it and then the goal. Because by the end of the 20, 21st century, we have to become the number one employer of our own people. That does not mean there should not. <clears throat> well, let me say it. Let me say it as nicely as I can. Entrepreneurship is critical for us, but entrepreneurship is not right for all black people. Right. We, do not, we know some Negroes that should not be within 100 yards of owning a business. Keep your <laughs> black man to the job, okay? Get a damn job, all right? right? Because we have two kinds of uh, uh, business people. We got business people and we have business people. <laughs> and you know what we try to do at the Power Networking Conference is put the business people out of business. Because Hello. the message for those of us who are trying to do business right, do business with excellence. What did I say? Either we are excellent in our business or we are invisible. There's no in between for us. Right. So you're excellent at your business. So you're still in, here. We are 14 years later having a conversation. I'm still, you're still doing it, George. Still doing your thing, still growing. All right. So that's what we have to do. And that's how we have to do it. So now, uh, also, I'm not hating on brothers and sisters that have jobs because we need brothers and sisters everywhere. We need brothers and sisters who are strategically and tactically uh, 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 positioned in the public and private sector workplace so that we can access the resources that we deserve because of the profits we help generate for those institutions. So we need brother because white people don't get up in the morning and get around the conference table and say, oh, what are we going to do for black people today? Oh, hell to the no. The only reason they would even think that is if there's a black face present who's saying, because they're woke and conscious, what about black people? What about black people? And George, you, you know what? It's, it's, it's funny you said that. My previous two interviews that led up to you 
being the anchor of our week was with a gentleman named Eric K. Dargan. He's the chief operating officer of the public works for the city of Houston. My interview before that was with a gentleman named Marshall J. Tagger, the first chief executive officer for Montgomery Regional Airport. So George, mm -hmm. I have been listening and doing the execution that you taught me from the day you and I met, and I have been on that mission until the day I die. So I get it. That's awesome. I know you do. Here's what Toni Morrison, the great Nobel Pulitzer Prize winning author said before she died. This is Toni Morrison. She said, and I quote Toni Morrison. This is it right here. When you get these jobs that you have been so brilliantly trained for, just remember that your real job is that if you are free, you need to free somebody else. And if you have some power, then your job is to empower somebody else. That's your moral and spiritual obligation as a black person to your own people. So, George, why don't black people in positions of power influence not do that often? I asked Eric Dargan this question earlier today, and I said, it amazes me. I have a lot of white peers, friends that are in executive suite, you know, positions and I, asked, I said, they don't think twice about if they hired somebody or refer somebody that failed, they'll give them another chance. But with us, we get into that C-suite and it's almost like we put a chain around the door. We put double locks and we refuse to give us an opportunity. Why is that? And, and I know it's four or five hundred years of slavery and mentality, but. I can't accept that as 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 a reason. Because guess what? If that was the situation, you would have never gave him, given me a chance to come on your platform as a newbie who was unqualified on the speaking tour. But I had some skills. But if you did the same thing, I wouldn't be here today in this lane. I'd be somewhere because I'm driven. But I wouldn't right. be this way and having this conversation. So so talk to that about that pathology, George. Yeah, that's a that's a deep question, Dale. Deep question. That's a deep question, and I want to I want to give you uh, the answer and still be loved. So I want to warn you. Yes, brothers and sisters, for those of you watching, yes, I am black. In case you were not entirely sure, <laughs> that's the beauty of our culture and race. We come in all shapes, sizes, skin tones, and hair textures. Right? So I've been black for seventy five years. I'm a race man. Just Google me, right? What is a race man or a race woman? It is someone that has committed uh, their time, talent, and treasure into the investment and upliftment of his or her own people first. That's what a race man is. Okay, so I'm a race man. So I want to say this and still be loved. Uh, there's, a, there's a riff I give on what will be your legacy. That's what it's called that the legacy for baby boomers i'm the oldest baby boomer at 75 the youngest baby boomer is 55. i'm the oldest generation alive that participated in civil rights voting rights and public access born in 1945. that movement ended with me my generation that's our legacy civil rights voting rights public access that's what our legacy is so, so did my generation yeah. abdicate our role? Did we mm -hmm. abdicate our role from you guys? I'm, 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 no. Yeah, okay. we did. We did in another way. Okay. There, there's, my, there's my, a, my, my there's thing, a, I didn't mean to interrupt, George. There's a, that, yeah, there's a before George uh, Floyd, and now there's going to be a new after George Floyd. Things are going to change. I, I promise you that. Right. And so I'm going to get to this answer that because a very important question. Why do brothers and sisters who, who get to the C-suites don't really do what they can do? Many of them, not all of them, but many of them, too many of them, quite, quite frankly. Um, and, the, and so that's a George Floyd before and after answer. That was absolutely the case before George Floyd. It will not be the case 
after George Floyd. I cannot tell you how many corporate black people I've heard from sponsoring the Power Networking Conference since George Floyd. The corporate floodgates are going to open. I know you saw that Amazon just gave $120 million to HBCUs, right? Just Netflix, this, right? Netflix, Netflix, right. Netflix, George, Netflix. Is it Amazon or Netflix? Netflix. It was Netflix. 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 I'm sorry, I got that wrong. Right, right. Amazon need to give 120 million too. That's right. right. Netflix was it? Was it? It wasn't. Uh, I got. I got my people mixed up. But anyway, so the 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 legacy of my generation is firmly planted. The real question is, and to, is to understand that we're all drinking from wells that we did not dig, that we're standing on the shoulders of giants. And so the question is, are we worthy of that legacy, right? A 250-year fight for freedom that from 1619 to 1864. And we read about the generations that fought and died for that, from Harriet Tubman to Frederick Douglass, right? That's their legacy. We're still making movies and writing books about them. They're making movies and writing books about Dr. King and Malcolm and so forth, right? Those two legacies is what we could take credit for over the last, let's say, 22 generations. The real question now becomes is what will be generation X, Y, Z, and generation Alpha, children of the millennials, what will be their legacy? Will their legacy be Black Lives Matter? And then I say, one of the beautiful things I love about young Black people is that they are unapologetically Black. They are unapologetically Black. We were not in my generation. We were trying to be white. We were trying to speak to King's English, wearing Ivy League clothing, a taché case buttoned up. We were trying to be white. Why were we trying to be white? We were trying to get jobs. Right. We didn't start no damn businesses. We gave that idea up when we got involved in integration. So yep. we were trying to get jobs. We wanted to live in the suburbs next door to them. We wanted to go to their little white school and put our black kids in those schools because we thought the white genes would jump into the little black kids' brains and make them smarter like white. So we were trying to be white. Y'all try y'all are unapologetically black. I love that. Now those who occupy the C-suites are my generation. Remember, the, the youngest boomer is 55. I'm 75. So they're in their prime position to occupy a seat suite, right? They're still thinking like we were taught to think. There's fear there. They're coveting their job. This is before George Floyd. Now, after George Floyd, the whole game has changed. The whole game has changed. And they have a new responsibility and a new job. Their bosses are coming to them. My good friend uh, uh, who's in diversity, her sister's one of the better sisters in diversity, she says she has so much new business after George Floyd that she doesn't even know how to handle it. That every corporate client she's ever had and their friends are calling her, throwing money at her. You, right? You know, so, George, so you got to change. We got to change. We got to take the money, but we got to give them something for it. You know, somebody, I'm just going to uh, interject here. That's, that's a sad statement, but a great statement at the same time. That I have five uh, friends of mine that are in the director and a couple of them in the C suite that called me over the last three weeks. My boss, this is what they said, came to them and said, hey, how can we get on the right side of this social injustice? That's right. And George, they called me and asked what my opinion was. And I said, well, it's real simple. Just like you said, George, with your friend that's getting buku business. Hey, do business with black qualified businesses, notwithstanding qualified, hiring. Qualified. 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 And Nick, I learned this from George. That's the reason why I speak voriscally about this with passion unapologetically because I told my buddy, he's, he's a VP of a bank. I said, you're having a dialogue with your boss, but you've been there 15 years and you manage 400 banks. 
You earn the right to tell him what he needs to hear. Hire qualified black businesses in addition to hiring people to work for you because just like you, they did an executive search to give you that opportunity to grow with the company. Why can't they do an executive search and find qualified businesses like ours? That's and right. so, so back to you, George, but I just had to talk to that because it's, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. No, you completed that thought. That's powerful, and that's exactly right. And 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 they need to hear voices like that now, and they're ready to hear voices like that because this is going to be a period of repentance for white people. Okay, they are. You're talking about guilt. Not that all of this stuff wasn't going on before, except now we're filming it. Right. And I heard on uh, MSNBC the other night, uh, Lawrence O'Donnell was saying they have more video footage of grievances and police abuse and stupidity than they know what to do with. Right. So they're we're flooding the social media and uh, 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 public media with these stories. Right. So it is in their face. They're uncomfortable with it. They have never had to be confronted uh, with uh, the racial injustices as they as they are seeing them live and in a living color. And the horizontal lynching of George Floyd was the straw that broke the camel's back. Right. And now that this moment for us. Was the Emmett Till moment of mm. my parents, which mm. led to the movement of civil rights, voting rights, and public access, right? That was the inspiration. The country was evolved, appalled by that. Well, this went global. The whole world became appalled by George Floyd. So all the scab was, the, you know, the scab was peeled off the wound. So they're going to react to it. They're going to do something about it. They're going to invest in it. Be in the fr in front or in the middle of that investment, but bring something of value to the table. You know, it's, it's funny you say that, George, because prior to COVID-19, I had taken my business online in the financial education world uh, last time you and I connected in 2015 because I realized, you know what, a lot of stuff that I do can be done over this medium. So why waste my time and go drive somewhere when I could talk to you this way? And corporations have been doing it for generations across the pond. They're doing billion dollar deals in Europe and in India, just doing video conferencing. So right. I start laying the foundation is what you talked about. You know, preparedness is, is success is when preparedness meets opportunity. So right. literally with COVID-19, my business tripled since COVID-19. And that's what brought the genesis of DJ the Money Coach LLC is actually Nick can chime in right here. Nick is actually a client of mine from almost 12 months ago. Nick, chime in a little bit and tell George about that yeah. because I have been a student of George for 14 years. Well, Dr. Frazier, you were you were absolutely right uh, when you said that uh, Dale and I are equally yoked uh, because that's what that's what brought me to to his team. You know, he helped me start my journey to become financially free and in terms of becoming debt free and in terms of saving lots of money and in terms of setting up my, my own entity so I can uh, begin a journey towards living the pom pom lifestyle. And since he saw my discipline and my self accountability, those two dirty words that he uh, loves to mention, that's, that's why he brought me up uh, to, to brought me on to join his team. Yeah, that, that uh, I can't say enough about that, Dale. That is so beautiful. All I can tell you is you've learned well. And what I want to tell, tell our viewers out here very quickly that to be black and beautiful means nothing unless you're black and powerful. Let's, get, let's just get that straight. Um, you cannot be black and proud and niggas too, okay? That white folks are planning for three generations and we're planning for Saturday night. Right. Because old brothers and sisters is to win, not to look like we're winning. I would rather carry a plastic bag with five thousand dollars in it than to carry a five thousand dollar Louis Vuitton bag with a hundred dollars in it. You ain't winning. Louis Vuitton 
winning. Nike is winning. Gucci is winning. Armani is winning. You ain't winning. We are the consumption class. They are the merchant class. They make stuff. We buy stuff. Mm. It is interesting to me that the rich stay rich by pretending to be poor and the poor stay poor by pretending to be rich. Right? We got the, we got the shit ass backwards. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so nothing changes, and all the statistics tell us this. The oh Institute my. of Policy Studies, April twenty seventeen, the state, the economic state of Black America said, and I give you the final quote from that three hundred page study, which no Negro read. <laughs> this is what we said. That by 2053, 10 years after the majority becomes the minority, if nothing changes among African Americans, household median wealth will be zero. Mm. Zero. In effect, we will have worked our way into a second slavery. Try to operate in a market based economy and a democratic capitalistic society without money. Mm. Let's see how that works for you. Oh, man. You on us. And ain't nobody fixing us but us. White people, white people are not fixing black people. It's been 400 years and we ain't fixed. Mm. It ain't their job. People are not even thinking about black people. And I'm not hating on white people. I'm just right. telling the truth. You know who white people are thinking about? They're thinking about white, white people. people. They're thinking about their, husbands, their wives, <laughs> their children, their communities, their schools, their businesses, and your pockets. That's what they're thinking about. And you can't hate on them. Exactly. exactly. You ought to be thinking about. Hey, hey, I'm thinking. Hey, George, I've done exactly what you've done. We have put together a team on DJ the Money Coach LLC of nothing but black professional. I'm proud that I finally accepted my calling 100% like you did, George. And we have nine people on our team, age 26 to 32, that are high end black professionals, George. Just like you've been doing it since I met you, and I finally figured it out how to make it work. And it's amazing. I'm so relieved that we're able to do this. That I'm just uh, flabbergasted. I didn't do this a long time ago. I tried with, with my good friends that when, when we met. And sometimes egos get in the way, George. But I didn't uh, cast any blame on anybody. I just kept grinding until God showed me the way and kept following the mentorship from you directly and indirectly when we haven't been together. And I kept reading books, kept educating myself, George kept going to conferences, and God just opened up the door and said, look, here's what you're supposed to do. You have a calling. You got to go honor that calling. And from there, it seems like things have just become better. And like you said, I've owned the same car about five years after I met you, George. I owned a 2002 Avalon with 188,000 miles I paid cash for back in 2007. I paid $8,000 for it, George. I ride it with pride. That's right. Man. Every car I got, I own, and I put the money to work versus trying to look like I'm successful. I build successful businesses because I learned that from you, George. So, George, how can we get our children to turn off these televisions, turn off this Internet, and get focused on the real economy and coding and the transgenerational wealth that's going to change with this seminal moment of George Floyd? And I believe it's their responsibility and their parents' responsibility. But, George, you've been doing it. Tell us how to crack that, you know, question there. Well, first, we have to change minds and hearts. It's easy to say, difficult to do. The best way to do it, Nick, the best way to do it, Dale, let me just tell you the simplest and best way to do it. Model the behavior that you expect from your people. Model the behavior that you will expect from your children and your wife and your close circle of friends. And we will we will change them one person at a time. Right now, some people will never get it. Right. I've come up with what I call my 85 10 4 1 rule. Now, this is 40 years of service to black people. And I came up with this rule at 73 years old. Wow. Let me tell you. Let me tell you what the rule is. It's 85 10 4 1 rule. Write it down. 85 10 4 1 rule. Okay. 85% of, of our people are sleepwalking through life. 10% are pimping the sleepwalkers. 4% are 
have pulled themselves out of that dark, sunken place and are ready to see the light. One percent are the light, and they're ready to help the four percent get woke. Now, let's do the math on that. There are 48 million black people in America. Four percent are ready for this kind of kind of conversation. 1.8, 1.9 million. I, yeah, about two million people. One mm -hmm. percent are the trainers, the coaches, the mentors, the modelers. That's like 420,000. That's right. That's about 500,000, right? 480,000. Right. So we're talking about 2.2, 2.3 million black people who are ready for this conversation. Those are the ones I'm focused on. Those are the ones that everything that I produced is designed for them. Those are the ones that come to the Power Networking Conference that engage in our WINS Wealth Building Center and curriculum and training. Those are the ones who became citizens of Fraser Nation, citizens of generational wealth, where our citizens are committed to <clears throat> excellence, demonstrated excellence. They are committed to equity and investment, and they are committed to entrepreneurial thinking. I didn't say entrepreneurship. First things first, second things never. Entrepreneurial thinking, taking risks, taking responsibility, and taking ownership for your own damn life. Mm. And once you begin thinking like that, that could possibly morph into entrepreneurship because entrepreneurship is no joke. It is not for everyone, right? Now, what I'm saying is also not for everyone. And you should not wait, and I'm not waiting for all black people to get their shit together and to agree with me or you. I'm not waiting for that. All black people have never done anything. Right. All black people <laughs> didn't want to be free. That's why Harriet Tubman had to carry a gun. All black people didn't support Dr. King. All black people didn't support Malcolm X. All black people didn't support Marcus Garvey. All black people didn't support W.E.B. Du Bois. That's why he left this damn country and went and, and, and moved to Ghana. So all don't wait for all black people. Find the right people that share your vision, that want what you want, right, that are going where you're going. That in, in some cases, your group, so there should, should be some people in there that are smarter than you. If you're the smartest Absolutely. person in the network, you're in the wrong damn network. How are you going to grow? Who's lifting, reaching down and lifting you up? So that's how we're going to do it with that kind of determined and aggressive attitude. We are going to save ourselves. My folks ain't saving us. 400 years, we ain't saved. Right. And it's going to come. And this is the boy. I'm not saying anything new. It's going to come from the best and brightest and the talented 10th. It's going to come from the brain of our race. Let me put that in a metaphor and then I'm finished. <laughs> I said earlier that we must be more intellectually curious and thus lays the foundation for critical thinking. I know it's behind Nick. Or books. You notice behind me, Nick, of books. I bet if we were in, in Dale's house, we would probably be books behind him. I got books. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we we are missing at this moment in time a critical mass of critical thinkers in our culture. This is this is the boys' argument. We need a brain. Why have we gone backwards in the last 50 years, certainly from a socioeconomic level? Because we're missing the leadership. We have not replaced Malcolm or Martin. And a people need to be led. If the fish stinks, look to the head. If the fish stinks, look to the head. Leadership, leadership, leadership. It needs a brain. Your body is the metaphor has 10 systems, circulatory system, nervous system, skeletal system. Uh, uh, you, you, we have 10 systems. And what is those? what are those 10 systems run by? The 
brain. Yep. It all starts here. Those systems will not run properly without a brain. We are not running properly because we don't have the brains, right? We do have the brains. We're just not using them. They're aggregated, right? We have not aggregated those brains, and we and, and that's what we have to do. That's how it's going to. This is why we started Fraser Nation. We are an aggregation of over a million of the best and brightest black people globally. You can go to FraserNation.com, OneFraserNation.com, OneFraserNation.com. We birthed this nation with our own damn flag last year at the power networking company absolutely you right? speaking about that george what are, are is your uh pnc still uh taking place in houston, oh, yeah. or we're, in houston. we're in houston we're in houston right. this year october 7th 14th through the 17th we had to move it from july as you know it's normally in the summertime we right. had to move it for obvious reasons so it's okay. october 14th through the 17th i want to make a special offer to your absolutely. listeners before we get off of here tonight um but but but, but that's what has to happen. And it's going to happen because young brothers like you, Dale, and you, Nick, and young sisters and succeeding generations, we're going to pass this baton to. I'm running out of time. I'm not going to be able to get all the work done needed to get us uh, headed in the right direction. So we're building the infrastructure, passing the baton on to you to take it to the next lap or two, or three, or four, or five. I'm working on succession. I will be introducing at the Power Networking Conference our succession plan. Oh, man. Please, oh, please, tell, us about, please tell us about the all-star cast you have. I mean, you got some impressive people that are going to be up on your platform in Houston, October 14th and 17th. Tell us, tell us about those amazing people. I know a well, couple. Well, we, got, we got Dr. Randall Pinkett. I know you know Randall Pinkett. We got Boyce Watkins. I know you know Boyce Watkins. Now, we have a special guest. I just want to spend a minute on this special guest. This is going to blow you away. This is, now, this is a once-in-a-lifetime thing. George is the Pied Piper. <laughs> right. This is a once-in-a-lifetime thing. I'm so proud of this. We are going to, we, we're going to establish the first... International Marcus Garvey Award. Wow. And we're going to give that first award, who will be at the conference, who is 86 years old, to Dr. Julius Garvey, the son of Marcus Garvey. Wow. Not his grandson, his son. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> right. wow. So you're talking about sitting, sitting at the feet of masters, icons. Right. I consider wow. Marcus Garvey one of the greatest leaders, black leaders who have ever lived. So so it's people like that. You know, all the other ones, you know, all the usual uh, the usual suspects. People can go on um, powernetworkingconference.com, powernetworkingconference.com and see the entire um, uh, menu of all star speakers. Right. We always we're gonna, we're have. We're going to put the links in, 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 in the uh, yeah. broadcast Power below George, George, with all the information, yeah. George. Now, for those of you who are, were smart enough to watch tonight, let me make you a special offer. This is this is my D DJ offer. This is because of DJ. Okay? All right. Let's get this straight. And you only have one hour to take advantage of this offer. And this offer is only good for five people. Why? Because it's a crazy-ass offer. And okay. my controller said you could only do this for five people. Uh, a, 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 an adult registration to the conference is $1,500. If you met one person that could help change the trajectory of your life, would that be worth $1,500? The answer to that, in case you haven't figured it out, is hell to the yes. You're going to meet more. Yes, money. absolutely. Hell to the yes. Okay. Every dollar is worth it. We encourage you to bring young people, college age, 17 to 25. They should be sitting at the feet of masters. You should be coaching them and mentoring them. Right. We don't have them running around in packs wild in our conference. No, 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 no. We're very controlled, very managed. Right. And a, a student registration is eight hundred dollars. So eight hundred dollars for a student, uh, fifteen hundred dollars for a an adult. That's twenty three hundred dollars for both. We're going to reduce that by nineteen hundred dollars. Reduce it to three hundred and ninety nine dollars. Oh, wow. And you can bring one adult. And a student for three hundred ninety-nine dollars. Wow. That's a nineteen hundred dollar discount. The first five people get it. Now you can't go to my website and get that. There's a there's offer on the website, 
but it ain't this off. This wow, is an Lord, thank you. right through here. Okay, us. You can only get that offer through me. You have to personally email me at gfraser at frasernet.com. That's gfraser at frasernet.com. That's gfraser, F R A S S and Sam, E R at frasernet.com. In the subject line, say, I'm in. I'm in. In the body of the email, Put your full name and your cell number, your full name and your cell number, your full name and your cell number. I will personally call you. We'll handle our business. We'll chat it up for a bit. And then I'm on to the next person. The first five people, all emails are time stamped, So I know who the first five people are. So that's the offer. It's an offer because I have mad respect for GJ. The money coach, Nick, I love you for for listening. <laughs> listening is powerful. Right? Sometimes and most of the time, really, listening is more powerful than speaking. There are times when you have to speak, you have to speak up and speak out. But there are more often times that you must listen, right? And you must listen with your eyes and speak with your ears you see you speak based on what you have heard right what you've heard right so that's my story i'm sticking to it Woo. This, well hey george i awesome. really i really appreciate your time um i just want to say a uh, couple of things but i want to get a quick insight for nick because um uh, I learned from you well. I've been sitting at your feet for 14 years. And one thing you always had to do is slow me down. Hey, Dale. Hey, man. Sometimes you got to slow down listening. You can't be the bull in the tight shop all the time. And it took me 14 years to get that, that message. And I got it now. So I would like, uh, Nick, chime in. And what'd you get out of this in 30 seconds, Nick? Because this <laughs> is a privilege and an honor every time I have a chance to be a mentor and get words from, from George. So how, how did you get impacted by this powerful legend and the elder of all our elders. Wow. <laughs> wow. Well, my, my cup is, is definitely uh, running over right now. Uh, there were so many things that I took away from this conversation. Uh, I would like to zone in on education. That was a major, major aspect of this conversation, a major foundation to our individual and our collective advancement. Uh, I, I'm, an, I'm an educator in the, in the formal sense of the word, but I also emphasize lifelong education outside of the formal setting, uh, as you see the books in my background. Right. And, and you mentioned you mentioned Amos Wilson. I have a, I have a couple Amos Wilson's book, uh, Wilson books in my, in my library, and I believe it was uh, Developmental Psychology of the Black Child. He said that the, the primary function of education isn't to get a job, isn't to move up in the social ladder, but it's to secure the survival of a people. But in this generation, we want to take it to the next That's level. Deep, right? That's deep. That's deep. Yeah, we want That's to take it to the next level. And right. not just say survival, but the thriving of a people. That's we want right. to do more That's than survive. Right. We, want to, we want to thrive now. You know, so that's so that education is is major, you know. So once again, Dr. Frazier, thank you for your contributions over the years. You know, uh, thank you for this opportunity for me to, for me to sit at your feet and, and learn from you. And it's it's been an honor. Oh, thank you, man. I, I, I thank you so much. That's very kind. You made my day. I appreciate that. Really, no question. Well, How old are you? I'm I'm 29. I'll be turning 30 oh, at the end, end of this year. Yeah. Oh my God! Yeah, well, <laughs> that's a wonderful thing, man. I'm I'm so proud of you. And uh, at 29, you quoting Amos Wilson, you woke, and your country. <laughs> and uh, that's a fabulous thing, right? Um, and actually, you now that I think about it, you're one of the youngest people that I've talked to that actually knew who Amos Wilson was 
and could actually quote him. That's a, that's phenomenal. That's phenomenal. Hey, hey George, I, I, I learned I learned from you. I, hey, I, it's a blessing to have Nick on on our team. I mean, it's, yeah, it's yeah. an honor and a privilege to have him on our team. I know uh, you're busy, and again, I want to thank you for all the time that you spent with us and our audience. Uh, we're going to rebroadcast this as well. We're going to put all the information to uh, your organization uh, for FraserNet as well as the Power Network Conference is coming up this October 14th and 17th. Uh, the special offer for those first five people to reach out to you at gfraser at frasernet.com. Nick's going to put that information in there. Uh, what I want to say to our audience is that, hey, like this you know, interview, share it, and you execute from it because at the end of the day, you can't have a pom-pom lifestyle that's plenty of money, peace of mind, and travel the beaches of the world if you haven't filled up your institutional brain and did the work like George has done for the past quarter of a century in his lane and the blessing he came to you know, allow me to learn at, at his feet. So George, I appreciate everything you've done for us and I look forward to seeing you at the FraserNet Conference. And it's always a blessing. You don't look a day over 60. And uh, God bless you, my son. I appreciate that. Thank you. Keep doing that work, George. I appreciate you. Right. This is DJ The Money Thank Coach. You. We'll see you next time. Peace. Peace.